I just start. <laughs> the reason I put the map of Africa projecting to you the map of Africa is because I want to talk about migrations first within Africa. Now, in the olden days, we found a lot of fossil evidence and stuff going around along in this part of East Africa. That's where we found the famous Lucy in the sky, Lucy skeletons. Oh, name for Lucy in the sky with diamonds, the Beatles song that was playing that night. Uh, some of the earliest stone tools, some of the earliest evidence of Homo sapiens, and so a lot of fossil evidence concentrated on this area. However, lately we've been finding a lot of things in South Africa, like pigments and other fossil evidence and evidence of art and sand patterns from about 100,000 years ago, which means people were doing some cool stuff there too. And a couple of years ago, we found skulls that should be classified within the Homo sapien lineage in Morocco from dating from about 300,000 years ago. We've also found that this area of the world, the Congo, the Central African, uh, the Congo Basin, which is one of the richest rainforest areas in the world, but very bad at fossil production because it's a very humid area. There has also been evidence of human habitation there for a long time. So what I'm trying to tell you is that people were migrating and connected and interconnected across Africa and going back and forth. And we should, when we think about migrations, we should actually first talk about that's how people developed human beings within Africa, the center of African evolution. Now, our ideas about Africa, we often have these ideas. We, we really, it's hard to imagine how big Africa is. You could put at least three contiguous United States into Africa. It's 1.2 times larger than North America. So it's a very big continent and you will not run out of room walking around in Africa and you will not be able to figure out everything about South Africa from your J term, even though you're going everywhere within South Africa. Put differently, somebody tried this and squeeze almost all of Europe, the contiguous US, China, India, and Japan, just for fun into Africa. So it's a very large continent. And again, I say that because in some ways people talk about the out of Africa, this biological, the, the sort of one of the culmination of biological evolution is when human beings leave Africa. And guest in some ways writes as if they were looking for a better place, as if they'd sort of run out of Africa. And I'm what I want to emphasize is one, could have just stayed in Africa, we would all be fine there. That was a good place to be. People did go out from Africa and all over the world, but people also went back into Africa after they left and there were back migrations as well. So I just wanna make that clear because sometimes when we think about migration, we have only one lens for it. And I want us to start off with Africa because it's Africa, which is the cent which is central to people becoming people, being human, being interconnected and trading and migrating within Africa. And then it is this human capacity to interact, migrate and trade, which enables people to spread into all areas of the habitable world. This is the, some of the most incredible migrations were into Australia at about 50, 60,000 years ago, 65 maybe. So some incredible migrations and of course into the Americas as well. Um, this is really central to us being humans is being able to move, not necessarily because we need something better but being able to migrate into different places and to continue to be able to do that. And so in general, the way I approach human migration is that it is a huge achievement of human beings, both in the past and as Tariq was writing about in the present as well, when you meet somebody who's an immigrant or a migrant or has gone from one place to another, it's an enormous challenge, right? Tariq, yeah. what do you have to do? 
say like this kind of migration of like the home land to like the different state, for instance, the US, you would get obviously a passport, a visa, or documents along with that. Um, and there's also like questions about the border control or like the people at the border, if, if they're eligible to like enter the country or not. And I just feel like uh, immigrants, they always have like a a like a major process of like actually trying to like migrate to certain countries. Yeah. So, I mean, I think about this as central to human adaptation in the old days when there wasn't border controls and walls and those kinds of things. Uh, and fortunately, there weren't so that people could go into all these places and adapt and adapt those places to them. But in today's world, we've put up all kinds of walls and border controls and all of those things. And I guess my general message about this is that considering how central migration has been to human beings and human development and human evolution for 100,000, 300,000, maybe a million years, it's a very risky idea when we try to keep people in one place and we try to put walls and borders up and check their documents and do these kinds of things. These kinds of things often end up backfiring and they end up creating problems where there don't have to be problems. Now, I'm not trying to say that everything should be open and all that stuff. And there are probably times that we want to limit the flow of people from one place to another. I'm not trying to say it, it has no merit, but you just have to, I guess, considering how central migration is to human development, you just have to be careful. I would always try to err on the side of giving people more mobility than giving them, trying to constrict or constrain the mobility in the world. It's risky. Watch out when you do it. So we've been talking about Africa because I think, again, <laughs> migrations within Africa are not talked about enough and the reasons for why people moved all over the habitable world. I want to spend some time with some places that we don't necessarily hear about as much. <laughs> So we know that in the Americas, the people who were here first were in, became indigenous or the native North, the native Americans in this place. And we know that when the Europeans showed up, there were already people there. But one thing that people don't always know about is how much the Spanish, or Spanish explorers and colonizers were really the people who founded all of the European settlements in North America. This is an incredible map uh, that you can find at Wiki Commons about the, you know, what he calls Spanish North America or Norte Americana Española. And it's really, it's like I said, it's quite incredible. And in some ways, uh, and this will probably be, you know, the first language, the first European language that people were speaking in almost all of North America was Spanish to a degree, French next. Um, and then the, the English are really latecomers to this. And the Spanish were probably not very concerned about a few tiny settlements in places that they had already kind of been to and were ignoring by then. They actually had missions in, in Georgia before the, before the English ever got there. Um, they had settlements, pretty developed settlements, huge cattle ranches in what is now Mexico, long before there was ever any uh, Anglo presence in the Americas. And so in some ways, the small settlements in the, in the northeast of the United States, what is now the United States, would have been of little concern to a hugely established and vast Spanish empire. They had explored as far north as Alaska and had you know, developed settlements, quite developed settlements in most of what is now North America, including as far north as Colorado, which obviously Montana has Spanish derived names. And most of the cities and states and streets are named after, are, are named uh, by the Spaniards in this area. In fact, in my first class of J term, colonial Latin America, I think I'm gonna say that, you know, if we're, if we're studying colonial Latin America, it includes almost all of what is now the United States. We might as well call it colonial Americas because it's almost all included in Latin America up until the, uh, the war with Mexico in the 1860s. 
to explain this history to us, we'll let Los Tigres del Norte tell us about it. Oh, <laughs> wow, too loud. Next song will be so loud. As we saw in the class before, as Bob Marley tells us, another historian. And if you know your history and you know where you're coming from, you wouldn't have to ask me who the heck do I think I am, which certainly applies in many of the southwestern states of the United States where people travel to and wonder why there are people there who are there. Now, in the class where I introduced this song, you said you didn't, didn't know about the Buffalo Soldiers, so... Now I'll give you this song too. We've learned Bob Marley is not a little bit loose with facts, but he's not wrong that many of the enslaved Africans first spent some time in the Caribbean. As we've seen before, that was one of the biggest destinations for enslaved Africans and we also learned about how the Haitian Revolution was crucial to the Louisiana Purchase, which helped the United States expanding westward. At the time of the Civil War, though, of course, this land was basically belonged to Mexico. And the Buffalo Soldiers were originally members of a 10th Cavalry Regiment, formed in 1866 in Kansas. And if you think about that year, 1866, I mean, it's right after the Civil War, we're probably dealing with people who were, who were, who had recently this been, been freed from enslavement and signed into the military. And these were black regiments that then, you know, were posted in all parts of the West in order to basically uh, fight the fight against Mexicans and uh, and win win the war for America, as uh, Marley puts it, the war against Mexico, um, but also the Native Americans. And so apparently, it's you know there's some debate about exactly who how they got this nickname, but they were it may have been from Native American groups who were fighting in what is called the Indian Wars, which is. Pretty incredible when you think about that terminology. Now, it isn't a, a sad thing that this story has been completely erased from, or was once erased from US history. There's now been more attention to it in monuments, but if you look at Western, Western films or Western iconography, you would never know that there were black regiments in much of the West, uh, you know, fighting both uh, in the Mexican-American War and uh, to against uh, indigenous Americans. And so, you know, it's important that we recognize uh, their valor, bravery, and how important they were to the Western expansion of the United States. It is, I guess, ironic that there's, you know, that we, that one group was basically pitted against another, and you have the, the subduing of indigenous and Mexicans by uh, African American uh, soldiers, but history is a complicated thing. It's uh, a lot of this happened in Texas. And it, one of the interesting things about Texas is recently learned is that it has the largest number of African Americans as a number, almost 4 million, not as a percentage of the population. That would still be Mississippi, Louisiana, this area. But in sort of the overall, the overall population, it is Texas. And they were very crucial to, for example, the settlement of West Texas, where parts of my family have recently moved. And in some of the museums there, they are credited with, with their the, the Buffalo Soldier Regiments with their achievements. So what I've basically been trying to do up until now is to give us some sense of migrations and, and in places where we may not have expected them, Africa, the Americas, uh, different ways in which people were moved around. I want to continue that with the guest chapter with some of the examples that you've picked out of things that we may not have, have thought about before. International migrations, like into Saudi Arabia, 
right, Amy? What are they doing there? Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. I mean, usually when we think about labor immigrants, we think about people going to Europe or the United States. But in fact, Saudi Arabia, uh, some of the other Gulf states have been huge importers of labor over the past few years. Uh, I found this map, which was an interesting kind of uh, illustration of it. It's a little old, but it was a good map that showed that shows like remittances. So the red lines are money that comes from the people who are living and working in these places back into those. So uh, Amy, you were talking about the Egypt. It, it's a huge percentage of, of Egyptian GDP, which comes from workers who had moved to Saudi Arabia and are, are sending money back. Um, you know, also uh, into India, not as large a percentage of India's GDP, but a huge amount of money, which then goes back into uh, some of these other places. So again, an unexpected place in which people have migrated and immigrated around. There's another form of immigration, which we might not have thought about so much, entrepreneurial immigrants. Entrepreneurial immigrants. Josie, you talked about some of these who yeah. are entrepreneurs. Um, they're essentially um, kind of capitalists who um, see a market internationally and so just sort of start their own projects in other countries, um, hoping to sort of either make a profit or start a new sort of industry in that country. Um, the example I used was the Nicaragua Canal, which, I mean, it's been since stalled for about five years now, but um, uh, there was, um, I believe, a business in uh Hong Kong um, by uh, um, a Chinese entrepreneur called uh, Wang Jing, I think his name was. And um, he wanted to create a new canal in Central America that would be much better in his eyes than the Panama Canal because the large central river in Nicaragua is much wider. Um, one of the biggest problems with the Panama Canal is because it's so narrow, you can only fit so much cargo through there. And um, he wanted to make a new canal um, across Nicaragua there that would be much wider and much more accessible. And it would sort of, you know, um, rival the Panama Canal, which is American with a new Chinese Nicaragua Canal. Yeah, this is really fascinating for a number of reasons. I mean, one, the fact that the, a number of these entrepreneurial entrepreneurial immigrants are Chinese and going into different parts of the world and basically, yeah, mo I mean, yeah, mobilizing capital in ways that, you know, we hadn't ever thought of before. This uh, this is, is fascinating in, in part because, as you know, like Columbus was trying to get to Asia. And ever since the Americas were, were the Europeans were stumbling around the Americas, they kept trying various ways. And really for hundreds of years, people were crossing these areas and going and you know, shipping stuff across. And so these routes through Nicaragua are actually well-worn trade routes. They've been there for a long time. And in fact, the United States apparently bought up various plots of land because they were gonna put a canal through Nicaragua. As you can see, if you can get through various places on river, then you get to this pretty big lake and then you only got a little bit to go. Eventually, they were able to, well, for one, they fomented a little rebellion to make sure Panama got its technical independence from Colombia. So, you know, they're just a little, a little, little coup there so that they could do the Panama Canal, which is true. It's, it's a shorter distance, but it's you have to cut through land here, whereas some of these routes are in some ways still being used and are still a possibility. You're right, though, that it looks kind of Looks like it's not going to happen these days, but who knows? Maybe they'll restart it up. Beyond the economic concerns, um, a lot of scientists have ecological concerns because that would be a disaster. Yeah, I mean, the central it's not a good idea. It's like an extremely diverse ecosystem, and to sort of disrupt it with a huge canal would be very bad. Yeah, no, it's not a good idea, and many of the many of the projects in in Africa too have not been the best. 
environmentally speaking, but we don't have a great track record in the United States about that. By the way, I just want to just mention that these places, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, have been some of the largest areas of migrants coming into the United States over the past 20 or 30 years. They know why there's so many people coming to the United States from Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador. Why would people be coming from there? Yeah, Kat. I mean, certainly that's been, yeah. I mean, there's certainly been, and it's an increasing number of climate refugees, so farmland and stuff that get, that goes bad. Um, that's part of it. There's another, yeah. Higher wages, maybe. I mean, maybe they've been like poor in the United States working, and you know, eventually come back um, to uh, the country they were born in for to help out the family, maybe. Yeah, I mean, definitely, there's a lot of labor migration and looking for more better life and being able to send some money back or maybe yeah. even return. Sure, that's another reason. Anything else has been going on there, Shaylin? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's a big problem here is that, you know, these countries have been pretty poor for a while. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> Some of the governments. Some of our tax dollars, some of U.S. tax dollars, have gone to some of the worst governments, some of the most genocidal regimes in these places that have basically tried to eliminate in Guatemala the Maya populations or in Honduras the funding of the, of the right-wing government in Nicaragua and the counter the the contras and in el salvador some of the some of the worst human rights atrocities of our time uh, were helped and abetted by our tax dollars in the united states propping up people to grow bananas and various things that we like to have from there and so it created a lot of political unrest which has led to oh wow they're showing up in our place now because why hmm so anyway, one of those things. Oh, this was interesting. The, well, Tiana, what's surprising about this story? What's the first surprise? So basically, this example talks about a certain population of um stop for a second that's crazy all right there it's already amazing right the largest japanese population outside of japan is in brazil which is crazy okay go ahead yeah so um the example focused on when someone when like a group of them tried to go back to japan um they were actually um, treated as foreigners, even though they consider themselves Japanese, so and we change like the culture, the identity, the language. And so I thought it was really interesting and kind of shocking, like the ways in which like the government and like policies and stuff were set up to specifically discriminate against them and protect those who were like natively born in Japan at that time. And so the fact that they had to face that and then um kind of like that rejection from Japanese culture, even though they consider themselves a part of it still, um, actually persuaded some to just go back to Brazil and actually like accentuate like their Brazilian identity. Yeah, some of them went back to Brazil. Most of them, most of the ones that had gone to Japan did stay in Japan. But Kat, what did they do in Japan when they were there? Um, they kind of like that's where they decided to take on more of the Brazilian culture, right? When they were in Brazil, they were more so identifying themselves as like Japanese. But when they went back to Japan and stayed there, they were like they were like Japanese people aren't accepting us. Let's take more to the side that we're going to be accepted at. So they kind of brought themselves more toward that culture. 
and made like a separate documentary for children. Yeah, this is a pretty fascinating story as well. And, you know, like I said, it's surprising just to find that there's this pretty large Japanese population. Or, I mean, the, like I said, the largest outside of Japan is in Brazil. And uh, actually, I had to read a little bit about them. It turns out that, like the United States in the post-enslavement era, uh, Brazil wanted workers to work on their coffee and sugar plantations, coffee especially. The first thing they did was try to was import Italians. And so there were many Italians who were coming into Brazil, several million, it turns out. But in 1908, the Italian government decided that the conditions in Brazil were so bad that they prohibited Italians from going to Brazil. And so uh, Japan at that time uh, was in a, kind of a peasant country, and most of the most of the people who went to Brazil was around in the 1910s or so, and most of them went on to coffee plantations. And you're right, when they went, when some of them tried to come back, they were not accepted at all. So again, it was, we've been talking here about uh, what I might call unusual immigration stories, because it wants to get us a, give us a sense of that global, uh, the global issues of immigration before we turn to the, the United States where we see migration here. Now, in the United States, I want to turn to us for a second, and I want to do this a little bit different than I used to do it, in the sense that a lot of times when people are talking about immigration, they try to counter various myths. They try to say, if somebody says, oh, the immigrants are lazy they say no they have a high a high work ethic or they Americanize him to try to make us question identity and then return to the truth. The Obamas are Christians. Always repeat truths more than lies. So, you know, it's a strategy that it's hard to do this because academics are more inclined to counter lies than we are to repeat truths. So I'm going to try. So I got seven for you. Truth number one. So, the percentage of foreign-born residents in the United States is actually lower than it was 100 years ago. And it's lower than other countries, including our neighbors to the north, Canada. And I say this because a lot of people feel like immigrants are growing and growing and growing, and that we're one of the biggest countries of immigrants. But as a percentage of population, we're not. So in the United States, as of a couple of years ago, and all of my numbers are gonna be a little bit delayed because that's what happens with numbers. I try to update them every year. In 2021, it was around 13.6% of the US population had been born in another place. Now, if you compare that to say 1910 or 1890, the all time highs, it's less than that. So I sometimes worry in guest book, he talks about globalization and increasing migration. As a percentage of the population, migration even around the world is not necessarily higher than it was 100 or 150 years ago. In fact, it might be a little bit less. Yeah. Is this like including like 
the legal immigration. This is in, this is including undocumented migration migrants as well. So I'll talk about the undocumented in a little bit. It's also less than our neighbors to the north, Canada, way less. I don't know. I don't hear the Canadians yelling that much about this. They don't seem as, they're not sending people to the border and getting all upset. They seem fine, at least to me. I don't know. We're pretty close to them. I'm sure some of them are upset, but you know. It's funny you say that because I, I have actually heard a lot of Canadian um, politicians talking about closing off the American border because they think we're crazy. Yeah, I mean, they sometimes threaten it. They can't shut us off, though, because there's too much border there. Yeah, they can't build a wall along that whole thing. So, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure there are people upset. It's not like Canada's perfect. But, you know, before we get all excited about our population, we should know that. That's our first truth. I mentioned this truth in the last class because we often think that today's immigrants are going back and forth too much, and that the immigrants of the olden days just went and stayed. But in fact, if you look at the European immigrants to the United States, and this happened in other countries in the Americas as well, it's estimated that about 40% of them went back. They came here, made some money, went back to their place. This book is a great book called The National Integration of Italian Return Migration by Dino Sinel. What a great name. So what he's talking about here is what do you do with people who have gone to the United States or another place for a while? What do you do when they come back? Right. You have to sort of reintegrate them or integrate them into Italian society. You have to make them good Italians again. I was fortunate to be able to know about this because my great grandfather came to the United States where my grandfather was born and then took them all back to Italy when they were when my grandfather was six years old. So I knew about this because that's what you did. You came here, got a little money, went back to Italy, and got lived it up for a while. And then my grandfather obviously was able to come back here because he was in fact already an American citizen. So people went back and forth back then or tried to go back a lot. As I told you in the last class, we don't know about this because the people who went back aren't here. So we don't hear their stories. They became Italians. They, you know, they're just, just there now, just being Italian or German, whatever. My third truth. So a lot of people get upset with immigrants today because they don't think they have the same values and that Europeans came here because they wanted things like freedom and democracy and these things. So when I was with my Italian relatives being 10 years old and being a 10 year old fool they were talking about the old country and all the wonderful parties they had and the great food and the dances and the music and i finally got upset and i said why did you come here then if it was so great there didn't you come for freedom <laughs> i don't know what they teach you in school but that's what i believed and this old woman looked at me and she said do you think if we would have had enough food to eat, we would have ever come here? Slunk off. Because in fact, it wasn't, it, it wasn't for values or these things. People needed stuff and that's why they came. And so, well, Shailen, where, why do people come here today? What are people doing? What do they want? Um, sometimes they're coming for like, economic opportunities and money back and a lot of times they have families over here and that's easy to do. Yeah, so there's, you know, the necessities of life or the, the desire to have a better life has been something that has been true for many years. It's true today and it was true back then. So, yeah. 
we talked about this before in the language chapter. I had to go back and look at it. But a lot of people believe that the immigrants of today aren't immig aren't aren't assimilating like they did in the past. But even the Spanish speaking and Korean speaking and Chinese speaking immigrants of today, their grandchildren by the third generation will probably speak only English. And this is something that is why sociologists sometimes call the US a language graveyard. So I wanted to revisit this a little bit. Again, we talked about this in the language chapter and going back to the Germans that Ben Franklin was criticizing in Pennsylvania for not assimilating. Because PJ, you said you were surprised that this debate had been going on for so long. I mean, surprised, but also like not overly, like it wasn't like super shocking. It was just more shocking at like the, the different laws that had been created. So I feel like that's more of like a, I don't know, when you're younger, you're probably like, not too hot. Everybody loves all the different, and then you kind of not. So that was, that was the shocking part though, was that like I celebrated with the older boys and like elementary. So. Yeah, no, I mean, there have been various, various, uh, various attempts to limit different people and to send people to different places. I think I'll save some of that for the next class. But yes, this is an old, an old impulse that happened, like I said, back with Ben Franklin criticizing the Germans. And like we talked about, in almost, almost, or in, it's a very common pattern in, in, every immigrant group that your first generation is going to know the language of your own country. The second generation will be bilingual. And by the third, you got nothing, no language abilities from there. All right. Ah, yes, the undocumented immigrants. Some people call the illegal immigrants. Interestingly, although we hear about this on the news all the time, the overall number has been about the same or declining since 2008, 2010. And we don't have the latest figures, but basically if you look at the, the numbers, it peaked out at about 12 million people in 2008, 2010, and has been pretty stable since then. Now, no, as a percentage has actually gone down in the last 10 years from 3.8 to 3.1 percent. Most of the decline is because of people from Mexico who have either gone back or done different things. And so it's actually the Mexican population or Mexican undocumented population has dropped by about 2 million since 2011 partially because there are more opportunities in Mexico, partially because there was less opportunities in the United States during that period. There is an, has been an influx of other groups. We mentioned some Central American groups, which have actually increased. People from Venezuela has also increased uh, and often going through Mexico. Um, but it doesn't, it actually hasn't made up for the drop uh, in undocumented population from Mexico. So that's been, uh, that's actually been stable or declining. Again, if you look at the news on TV, it would make it seem like it's increasing and increasing, but as a percentage of the population and as in overall numbers, it's not actually that different. This is again, one of the myths about the undocumented immigrants is that they don't pay taxes. So many of the undocumented immigrants are actually on the books. They have either fake social security numbers or taxpayer identification numbers. And so we have this idea that most undocumented migrants are the kind of people you pick up on the side of the street and they work for cash. Actually, that's not the case. Most of them are working in jobs and paying taxes uh, on the books. Uh, they have papers, but they're not 
they're they're not official they're they're official documents but they're not they're not legal and so you know as an estimate for how much taxes are collected probably about 18 billion in federal income taxes and then of course they have to pay local taxes like sales taxes and stuff like that and so you know it's quite a lot of money that they are paying in taxes and many of them are contributing to things like social security that they probably won't ever get. They'll probably either have to, unless unless the, our immigration laws change drastically, they won't be able to access or get back the money that is put into social security. So again, this is a, a big myth in American life that people who are undocumented don't pay taxes. It's actually, more the case that they pay more and than they ever get in services. My saddest truth is that I've been trying to tell people these things and other people have been saying this for years. People have done research and done surveys and talked about immigrants' contribution to this and paying taxes, but it does not seem to budge any laws or policy or things like this. In this section, we see again the work of Jason de Leon, who wrote a best-selling book, The Land of Open Graves, about the Mexican-U.S. border and the things that were happening there. And, you know, it's it's a great book. It combines archaeology and biological anthropology and cultural anthropology, and uh, it's fun to read. I mean, there's some rough parts to it for sure, but he's a good writer. You can even read it on, get an audio book. So, you know, you can get it read to you. Bestseller. I actually assigned this book in the fall of 2016 to an intro class. And we had a great time reading it. And come November 2016, we were all into it. We were reading The Land of Open Graves, and we were talking about immigration. And then November 2016 hits, and boom, Trump's in. And I have to say that assigning this book, like the people who wanted to like believe about, you know, the the immigrants and the things that Jason de Leon describes, it reinforced their attitudes. But the people who are all into anti-immigration, into Trump, it just reinforced their attitudes as well. So we all ended up exactly in the same place. I haven't assigned it again, because why? Because it doesn't seem to change anything. <laughs>